For those of us who follow Jesus, today is a really special day. It's a holy day, and it's a day to remember and give thanks for his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. How will you set Good Friday apart as special? Maybe with some quiet time or personal prayer and praise, or maybe you'll attend a church service with family or friends. Well, regardless of your plans, I'm glad that you're here for another study in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and our teacher, of course, is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and he continues our look at the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled and those which are yet to be fulfilled by his second coming. But before we turn to Isaiah 16, verse 6, I can think of no better way to begin our time, this Good Friday time, than to celebrate lives God has changed through the cross. First is a text, actually, from a listener of our Amharic language program over in Ethiopia. I live in an area where most people are Muslim. I have become a Christian by listening to your programs. I often feel very alone, but your teaching makes me feel connected to other followers of Christ. Many of my neighbors are unhappy that I do not worship with them. I try to live in peace and show them Jesus in kind and considerate ways. Please pray I might be able to live as light in spiritual darkness around me. That's a great prayer request. Pray for him right now. And then here's one. This is from a listener of our Bengali language program in India. I am a blind man and grew up worshiping idols. While tuning my radio, I chanced upon this program and began listening regularly. On November 27, 2018, I was deeply touched and inspired by the message. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I started relying on God for everything. I'm thankful to Him for His love. Please uplift me in your prayers so I may be faithful to Christ and learning more about the Lord. Well, what wonderful letters that remind us of the power of God's Word. If you'd like to join our world prayer team as we pray for listeners like these and then ask God to reach into more hearts and homes with his word, visit ttb.org forward slash pray to sign up or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE for more information. I can guarantee you'll be blessed. Now let's commit this time to the Lord and remember to give thanks for the salvation of these brothers and sisters and for our new life in Christ as well. Heavenly Father, we come before you today humbled that you sacrificed your son to save us. As we listen, Lord, may we see Jesus in the words of Isaiah and then give praise for Jesus' resurrection that we celebrate this Sunday and every day of the year. For it's in his glorious name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, last time we began in chapter 15, a study of Moab. We're in a section now where there are burdens, is the way our translation has them. They could be called judgments. And it's the judgments of God upon about 11 nations that were in that day next to the nation Israel are had had some very direct contact with him. And the reason God judged each nation is it's given very definitely, by the way, why that he does that. And we saw that when we began about Moab, that the reason was pride. And when we get into chapter 16, we find out the first thing that Moab was asked to do because they were subject to Israel at this time was to send a lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness. Now, Selah was the rock-hewn city of Petra, and they had ascended unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. Now, I have many pictures that were made down in the rock-hewn city of Petra, some of them made up on Eldur, which is an altar up there. It's all hewn out of the rock where sacrifices were offered. Now, God says, send your offering up to the one altar, the burnt altar in Jerusalem that speaks of the cross of Christ, and they refuse to do it. They want to be religious without acknowledging the fact that they are subject to a higher will, that they are sinners in the sight of God, and that actually was the great sin of 
this nation. Now, in verse 6, we're told that. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud, even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Now, the reason that God had to reject and judge Moab was because of the fact that pride led them to reject God's proffered offer of mercy. God would have delivered them. You see, they also refused to give sanctuary to the folk in Israel. We find that later on. They stood on the sidelines. And they were judged because of the fact that instead of protecting their neighbor and being helpful to them, why they actually would not let the fugitives come and hide. If they did, they'd point them out. So Babylon and Assyria first and then Babylon could take them. This was the thing that brought down judgment upon it. And again, let me make this application that judgment came... And it came, as verse 14 says in the 16th chapter, within three years, as the years of a hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be contemned. That is, judgment would come in three years. And it did. Assyria destroyed this nation. And this was the judgment of God upon it. Now, why? Pride. That is one of the great sins of today. It was the sin... We saw that caused Lucifer, son of the morning, to be lifted up with pride and to lift his throne above the throne of God. He wanted to be independent of God. That was the thing he was after. He wanted to establish his own self-contained kingdom and no longer be dependent upon God. Now, actually, today, that is the position of all liberalism, those who reject the Word of God, those who reject revelation, basically the thing that causes them to do it is that which is in all of our hearts, pride. We'd like to do it ourselves. Most people want a do-it-yourself religion. They like that type of thing, and they want to do it. They want to do something to be saved. That ministers to our pride, you see. And today... You have, I would say, basically, they try to point out this, that, and the other thing, that there's so many church members that are hypocritical, that there are many church members that are very selfish, that there are very many church members today that actually are really anti-God. Well, it all basically rests upon the pride of the human heart. We've turned everyone to his own way. We want to go our way. We want to do it our way. Now, the judgment came upon Moab, and this out-of-the-way nation, entirely forgotten today, seems so insignificant as a message for us. Now, we come to chapter 17, and we come here, actually, to the fourth burden now. The fourth burden is the burden of Damascus. Now, Damascus was the capital of Syria and still is, by the way. And you have here really the burden of Damascus and Ephraim in the immediate future and the far-off future. Actually, what you have here is the nation of Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel. And at that time, they were lined up together. They were allied together. And more often came together to come down against the kingdom of Judah. And Damascus was the leading city of Syria. And you have here in chapter 17, now verse 1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Damascus and her ally, Ephraim, which are the ten tribes in the north. Now, let's look at these names for just a moment. Damascus was the capital and leading city of Syria in that day, just as it is today. It has been called the oldest living city in the world. Well, I've been to several places that make that same claim. 
you go to actually to Greece, way up above Corinth in the Peloponnesus, the city of Menelaus and Agamemnon, that Mycenaean civilization that actually was the beginning of Greek civilization. And they tell you that's the oldest place. However, there's not much around there today to call it a town or a city. A good Greek restaurant there, but that's about all. And then I've been to Jericho, and there is a sign when you make the turn down at the Jordan to go over to Jericho. It says so many kilometers over to Jericho, the world's oldest city. So I guess that about every place has the world's oldest city. I've been waiting for my native state of Texas to come up with that also. We've done pretty well with getting everything else in that great state. Why not have the oldest city? And I'm sure that they'll dig it up there somewhere someday. Well, Damascus has a good claim to it, by the way. It was Vitringo who wrote, Damascus has been destroyed oftener than any other town. It rises again from ashes. And we'll see that. Now, Damascus means Syria. Now, Ephraim is the name of a tribe of Israel. It's the name of a city. It's the name of a mountain. It's the name of a man. And it refers to the ten tribes, the ten northern tribes. That's one of the words used instead of Israel, several of the prophets. We will find that Hosea uses that expression, Ephraim. And Ephraim is like a heifer that goes backwards. Well, here it's used to represent the ten northern tribes, which are ordinarily called Israel. Now, here you have the burden of Damascus. And Damascus is to be taken away from being a city. It should be a ruinous heap. Now, there have been those that say, well, look, this is not fulfilled. Well, I think candidly that, as we have said, that there is a far-off fulfillment of all of these prophecies, and I think there's a local fulfillment too. Now, somebody said, then how would you understand this? Well, I feel that there are two possible explanations that certainly make sense to me. The first one is that historians are not always accurate. In fact, who was it that wrote the profound history not long ago and then made a statement that the biggest lies in the world have been historians? Well, historians haven't always been accurate in saying that this is the oldest city, that is, the original city of Damascus, because in that area there happened to be many ruins of a city. And actually, any one of these ruins could have been old Damascus and probably was. Damascus is like a great many of the ancient cities that when it was destroyed in one place, they didn't always build on the ruins of that place. They shifted it over and built it somewhere else. Certain cities they could not or would not because of the fact they were sacred to the people. Jerusalem is one like that. It been lots easier to gone over on the Mount of Olives and rebuilt Jerusalem at the time of Nehemiah. But they didn't do it because of the fact that so much that was sacred was connected with the old city. I don't think that was true of Damascus. And so we'll just leave it to the archaeologist. He hasn't yet come up with the answer of which one of those ruins will probably have been the oldest city. That's one explanation. And then the other is that it is the oldest city, and it has withstood the ravages of war. And it has never ceased being a city, although it's shifted locations. It is probably the oldest city in the world. But that city which has survived every catastrophe that's come upon this earth, and especially upon that land that has seen army after army march through them, it managed to survive but it will not survive during the Great Tribulation period. It will be destroyed. And as the writer says here, it will cease being a city. 
it shall become a ruinous heap. And I believe that actually both of these are accurate and both of these are true statements and certainly fulfill the prophecy. They're quite adequate to fulfill it. Now he says in verse 2, "...the cities of Aurear are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which lie down, and none shall make them afraid." Now, I probably ought to go back and give you another pronunciation of that. The cities of Aurear are are forsaken." And let's settle for a row air. They are forsaken, and they're going to be as flocks. Now, this was a suburban area near Damascus. The entire area would be destroyed. Now, that probably has happened in Damascus in the past. It will happen again, of course. And we find, verse 3, "...the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus..." And the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, the northern kingdom of Israel must bear her share of the burden of Damascus, or the judgment, because of the alliance that they have. Now, we are told in 2 Kings that both were besieged by tiglath pileser and they were finally both deported by the Assyrian Shalmaneser, and that's in 2 Kings 17, 6. Now, this certainly was a partial fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, and as far as many are concerned, it's the total fulfillment. I say that all of this is looking even to a future day, but we certainly have a partial fulfillment, and oftentimes you find that in the Word of God. In other words, God's letting you know it's going to be fulfilled. Now, what we have in the remainder of this, is that the judgment is going to be carried out. And I'm not going into detail here because we need to gain just a little momentum now. Verse 10, though, "...because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation." Now, he's talking here to the northern kingdom. "...and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and shall set it with strange slips. And what you have here is this. I think that it is something that was literally fulfilled, but it does have a spiritual application, as all of this does. It's to note how this land in our day has been planted with pleasant plants and slips. I had the privilege of setting out five trees up in the land of Israel. In fact, in the tribe of Issachar, there between Haifa and Nazareth. And the forests of the cedars of Levin have almost been removed. But there are many trees in that land, and the Mount of Olives was covered in that day with them. The enemy removed them, actually, while the Turks controlled Palestine they exacted a tax on trees. And so the few trees that were left, the people cut them down, and practically all the land was denuded of all greenery. Now, after World War I, England began a movement to plant trees in that land. And the present government of Israel has continued this policy, and literally millions of trees have been set out. Now, you have here in chapter 18... You have the next burden, and that's the fifth burden now, and it's the burden of the land beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And actually, there were those that thought at one time that he was talking about Egypt, but he's not talking about Egypt because that comes up next. And I hope that you hear the message next time because I'm going to see how literally prophecy has been fulfilled concerning Egypt. And that's one kingdom God's not through with. And it's interesting that out of the ancient world, this great kingdom has come down, but has come down exactly as God said it would. You can't guess like that, my beloved. But what do we mean here by the burden of the land beyond the rivers of Ethiopia? And it's certainly no description of Egypt at all to begin with. And then those today that try to bring in England and the United States, 
When I begin to hear that kind of interpretation, I feel like yawning because they weary me. That's not interpreting the Word of God at all. The fact of the matter is Ethiopia is the one that we're talking about. Now, there are two Ethiopias. The word that's used is Cush. And there's one in Asia, that's Genesis 2.13, and another in Africa, and that's Exodus 2.15 and 21. I believe we're talking about the Ethiopia now that's in Africa. I'm sure that's it, because it's the land beyond the rivers. And the rivers of Ethiopia was, of course, the Nile River. And what we have here is something I think that's quite wonderful. He says in verse 1, and we have here, God calls the world's attention to Ethiopia. That's interesting. Woe to the land, shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Now, the word woe here is an unfortunate word, because actually it's the same word in Isaiah 1-4 that's translated, ah, a people laden with iniquity. It's a sigh, or as you have it in Isaiah 55, ho, everyone that thirsted. And here God is saying, ho to the land. Listen to me. Hear this. That would be the way. Now, shadowing with wings, I think might be better translated, rustling with wings. And that is something that's quite interesting. Missionaries to that land have told me now for years that Ethiopia is known and noted as the land of birds. It's called the land of wings. And this is something that actually identifies it. I have a very wonderful missionary friend over there now. She was a former student of mine. She tells me that that is a means of identification. Now, will you notice? They sendeth ambassadors by the sea even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters. And vessels of bulrushes would not characterize actually any modern nation. You couldn't fit that into England or the United States because we just don't use them. And you couldn't get a steamship out of that as some have attempted to do. Well, the nation here, however, that is peeled and scattered and peeled, of course, is Israel. And what you have here, of course, is, I think, Ethiopia. And he says, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. Now, there have been a great many Bible students believe that this ensign is the ark of the tabernacle that was later on in the temple and that at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, that previously it had been transferred over to Ethiopia. And I'm told there's a church over there that the claim is made that it's in that church. Well, I don't know that. I couldn't prove anything. But an ensign will come out of that land. That's interesting. I don't know what it'll be, and I'm not attempting to say it. It's even what I've suggested. Verse 7, In that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled, this is Israel, and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. Now, this is evidently a reference to the fact that the Ethiopians See, there's no judgment against them, but what you have here, they will be at Jerusalem. And there's a marvelous verse that I call your attention to in the Psalms, where it says, they're going to ask the Ethiopian, what are you doing in Jerusalem? I guess same question. Maybe it's on the count of integration in that day. Maybe that'll come up in the millennium. But he's going to say, I was born here. I was born again here. God has wonderful things to say about Ethiopia. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. As we close, I want to let you know that all of us here at Through the Bible pray that your weekend is filled with meaning and joy as you celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. And for those who haven't yet made the decision to follow Jesus, you know there's no better time than today. This weekend is a special time of remembering and rejoicing in the miracle of Christ's victory over death. Won't you join us? To learn more about Jesus 
and how you can invite him into your life, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE and request a packet of information. It includes Dr. McGee's free booklet titled Faith Plus Nothing Equals Salvation. How do you like that math? Or to download the booklet right now and access a few other free resources we've set aside just for you, you can visit us at ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? For those of you already walking with the Lord, a great way to prepare your heart and mind for Resurrection Sunday would be to download and read the booklet, The Radical Cost of the Cross, What Jesus Really Paid for Your Salvation. And it's available to you at ttb.org forward slash booklets. And of course, it's free. Well, that's all for us today. I pray that God's grace, mercy, and peace would be with you today and every day until we meet again. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.